story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. We're now going to look at two prophets, Amos and Hosea, who come right in between Jonah and Nahum, so that uh, we're not taking them in quite the right chronological order. We're into the 8th century BC, and uh, they're often referred to as the 8th century prophets. Now what was man doing in the 8th century? It's very interesting to get the back cloth, <coughs> and the two great uh, names of man's activity were Rome and Greece. Rome and Carthage were both founded in the 8th century BC and if you know your history and you knew there was great rivalry between the two, the Punic Wars were between Rome and Carthage and Rome finally came out on top. And Rome was establishing law and order all around the Mediterranean world and building roads later, all of which were going to help the Gospel to be spread. What was Greece doing? Well, Greece was laying the foundations for the modern obsession with sport, which is the religion of the men of this country. And the Olympic Games were starting in the 8th century BC. Their language was spreading everywhere. If Romans built roads, it was the Greek language that was going to spread the Gospel quickly. And Homer was writing Iliad in the 8th century BC. They were laying the foundations for art and architecture, they were planting city-states everywhere and introducing democracy to the world through those city-states. Uh, there's no trace of democracy anywhere in Scripture. It came from Greece. It's not the biblical order of government at all. Further afield, the Chinese civilization was emerging and the Indian civilization. So man was very busy in the 8th century. An awful lot of our modern world goes back to the 8th century BC. But what was God doing in the 8th century BC? Well, the answer is he was having problems. Big problems with his people. His great plan was to win the world back to himself through his people but he couldn't even get his people right. And it was this big problem with his people that required the ministry of both Amos and Hosea. The whole plan was going wrong. He had made a covenant with this people, planted them at the crossroads of the world where everybody would see them, and made a simple covenant, you obey me and I bless you more than I bless anyone else. But you disobey me and I have to curse you more than I curse anybody else. That was their choice, their privilege and their responsibility. Now just let remi remind you that by the 8th century BC there were not one people of God but two and there had been this civil war. They became a kingdom, they got a visible king as well as an invisible one by their request. In spite of Samuel's protest, God told Samuel, tell them that kings come expensive, that they will tax you they will take your sons for the army and your daughters into the palace harem and they'll take, take, take. Earthly kings are expensive. Centralized government is expensive. But they still wanted a king so they got one. Saul, popular choice, good looking, handsome, tall, but coming from the tribe of Benjamin with some serious weaknesses of character. So God gave them a man after his own heart, King David. Alas, in one afternoon he broke five out of the Ten Commandments and was never the same afterwards and his family suffered. But Solomon his son brought great glory to the Kingdom of Israel but he did it by heavy taxation and by forced labour. He built a magnificent temple but I'm afraid taxation, heavy taxation and forced labour are not popular and as soon as he died, the north rebelled against the south because all the wealth was concentrated in the south. That sound familiar to you? And uh, the tribes of Scotland, sorry, the tribes of Israel, 
didn't like all the wealth being concentrated down here, and because of this taxation, as soon as Solomon died, there was civil war. Ten tribes in the north become Israel, two tribes in the south stay loyal to Jerusalem and to the royal line. But of course this meant that the north was without a temple and without a royal line, so they developed their own. In fact, they developed two temples, two kind of holy shrines, one at Bethel and one at Samaria. Beit El, that's where Jacob had his dream of the ladder, Beit El means house of God. And so they decided to have one temple there and one further north in Samaria. Do you remember the Samaritan woman saying to Jesus, should we worship here or in Jerusalem? All started way back here. So they developed their own temple and they developed their own royal line. But if you read the history in the book of Kings of the northern part of the people of God, they had very short reigns. The average was about three. Many of them were assassinated, there were takeovers, coups, a very unstable government in the north, but then it wasn't a government based on God's chosen royal line. And it's a sad history. In the south they had more stable government and the average reign of the kings of the south was 33. Or rather, it isn't quite just north and south. The average reign of a good king who did good in the sight of the Lord was 33 years. The average reign of the bad kings was only a few years. Very striking. 33 years, a good king. Does that make any sense to you? All right. Well, now let's try and paint a social picture of the north. That's what we're concerned with now because they were in the more serious condition. Israel was really in trouble was a real problem to God. Socially, we may say it was an era of peace and prosperity. Jonah's visit to Nineveh had been effective in postponing the Assyrian threat for some time. That generation of Assyrians did repent and uh, therefore the fear of Assyria was lost for a short time. And so there was peace, there was no immediate threat and a generation grew up that had never known war. That affects people. And so it became a time of great prosperity, especially under King Jeroboam II. And I've just jotted down the things that I've read about that era in the north. They were right on the trade routes, that road from Europe to Arabia, crossing the road from Egypt to the Asia, right here in the north, meant that they could trade very well. And so they got into the import-export business with a vengeance and developed commerce, developed a powerful merchant class, banks flourished, were lending money all over the place, the gross national product went up and up, the standard of living went up, they became a consumer society and luxury goods were everywhere, status symbols abounded and the status symbol was to have a second home what they called a summer house, where you could go in the heat of the summer, usually up in the hills, a holiday home. That really was a status symbol. They became preoccupied with material things, a covetous society, and a new aristocracy developed, the jet set, the get-rich-quick boys. And this overrode the old aristoc aristocratic lines. In a word, they became an affluent society and one of the most flourishing businesses was real estate. I mean with second homes and property going sky high in value, developers, monopolies, takeovers, it was all happening. Does this sound familiar by the way? <laughs> this is exactly the reign of Jeroboam II. Housing became a problem because as the rich got richer, the poor got poorer. And as the rich got second homes, many people didn't even have one, which caused unrest. Kind of thing that was happening in Wales a few years ago. And the middle class disappeared. And you began to be left with a very rich class and a very poor class. And that has happened in many countries. It's the most dangerous situation socially. Morally, the effects of all this affluence were financial scandals, bribery and corruption. Even the judiciary was being corrupted. You could get no justice in the courts. 
without slipping a few bribes to the judges. And those who use money to corrupt others will themselves be corrupted by it. They were soon into seven days a week trading because uh, they could make more money that way. And avarice led to injustice and affluence to permissiveness. Sexual laxity was the order of the day and alcohol consumption rose sharply. Who says the Bible isn't relevant? This is what happens when you get a generation of never known war. Peace and prosperity happened in the 1920s, happened in the 60s and 70s. Now, what happened to religious life at the same time? Surprisingly, it was booming. Religion was very popular, but it was not the religion of their fathers. It was all kinds of New Age faiths that were creeping in. Not orthodox, but faith that had been somehow mixed up with pagan beliefs and behaviour that were being imported from the people around them. There was great interest in Eastern and Western religions outside the people of God. And in particular, the, the religion was being focused on the creation rather than the creator on Mother Nature rather than Father God. And there was a great concern about the fertility of Mother Nature. Uh, and the fertility cults, as we call them, were creeping in. Now when Mother Earth becomes the focus and religion is feminized, especially with a god called Baal, who was male, and his wife Ashtati, who was female, and when we discuss uh, Daniel, we'll see the Ishtar gate in Babylon, which is the same word, Ishtar, Ishtati. This was the female of the species, and when goddesses come in, it's not long before religions become sexual in practice. And at the temples in the north, at Bethel and Samaria, there were prostitutes, male and female, and you worshipped God by having intercourse. Well, that would make religion fairly popular and the people were turning up in droves at the temples to go through this worship rite of intercourse which would bring fertility to the earth. You know, we're seeing this happen all over again in a very subtle way. When you lose sight of Father God, Mother Nature takes his place. And the lie is now being told that Mother Nature's future is in our hands and our future is in her hands. That is a lie. Both her future and ours are in his. And she's not a her anyway. She's in it. But you see what's happening. And our children are being taught this. Our children are more aware of environmental issues than they are of Bible knowledge, judging by things like blockbusters. You just watch quizzes on the TV and you'll see what children know most about very quickly. So there was an idolatry that led to immorality. They set up a golden calf at Bethel. I was recently in Frankfurt on Main, which is going to be the financial headquarters of the European community. They've built a new stock exchange and they have erected outside a huge golden calf. The worship of mammon is at the heart of the financial centre of the new Europe. All comes back again. That's what they did, the golden calf from Egypt. Here's a golden calf at Bethel now. And the trouble was everybody was complacent about these developments because they had happened so gradually. If they'd happened suddenly, there'd have been a horror. But they just slowly happened gradually and people accepted and didn't want to be thought old-fashioned and prudish. And so it crept up on them and they accepted it. Things that wouldn't have been accepted 20 years previously were now part of the general scene. Isn't this relevant? And this was God's holy people. This supposed to be a priesthood, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And they're getting just like everybody else. So did he have a problem? He could have washed his hands off them, he could have wiped them out, disowned them and looked for another people to start again. But God's not like that. And when God marries, he hates divorce. And when he makes a covenant, he stays with it. 
what he did was to discipline these people. And it's very interesting, Amos goes through the list of things through which God disciplined the ten tribes of the north. Number one, a food shortage. A number of harvests failed. This was God saying, wake up, you're dependent on me, not on the fertility goddesses, not on Mother Nature, it's me you should be looking at. And food shortage was the first discipline he applied. And Amos, in mentioning all these disciplines, has a refrain that keeps coming which is really quite sad, yet you did not return to me. I sent you a food shortage, yet you did not return to me. The next thing that God tried was a water shortage, shortage of fresh drinking water and interesting. He said, I tried to bring you to your senses by making water short. Do you know the world's going to be more short of water than food very soon? People still don't think of God. The third thing he tried was to send disease to the crops and the animals. And so the locusts came and mildew came, yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. There's a message coming through here. When a nation experiences trouble, they should turn to the Lord and say, what's wrong, Lord? But they didn't. The next thing, he sent plagues to the people, not just the animals and crops. See how this gets nearer and nearer to them. And now there were things like AIDS touching them. And still they didn't turn to the Lord. Yet you did not return to me. Then he sent raids from people around. There were people around coming in to raid them and still they didn't return. Then God fired some of their cities. Lightning set the wooden houses on fire and they lost. They had a series of disastrous fires, yet you did not return to me. None of this had any effect on them. And as long as they could keep their money and keep going and keep their holiday homes, they were happy. It just didn't touch them. There were two worst disasters yet to come and that would be the end. The first verse of Amos says, the prophecy of Amos, two years before the earthquake and a massive earthquake hit the ten northern tribes just after Amos preached. It was so big that it is still remembered by the prophet Zechariah 250 years later, he talks about the earthquake in the time of Amos. It must have been pretty bad. That wasn't the worst. The very worst thing was exile. If you won't pay any attention to all of this, says Amos, then out of the land the ten tribes will lose their home. And as we know, that happened. Now Amos 3 verse 7 says this, Surely the sovereign Yahweh does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants the prophets. And God is so amazingly merciful that he never punishes without sending a prophet first to say, now this is what will happen if there's the flexibility. God doesn't just do it. He sends someone first to say, this is going to happen unless. And God always gives warning. The whole book of Revelation is a warning to the whole world of what God is going to do with the whole world. And still people don't turn to him. How much more can God do? Well now, God was going to send two last prophets to the northern ten tribes, Amos and Hosea. And they are in such contrast. Amos was tough. Hosea was tender. Amos came with strong accusations of what they were doing wrong. Hosea came with a strong appeal to return to the Lord. Amos spoke to their minds. Hosea spoke to their hearts. Amos majored on the justice of God. Hosea majored on the mercy of God. Amos communicated the divine thoughts to them, but Hosea communicates the divine feelings to them. And that contrast, it's not absolute, there is some mercy in Amos 
and there is some justice in Hosea, but the main thrust was different. And I want you to notice that God's very last word was an appeal, a very tender, emotional appeal. Surely you won't do this. Surely you won't force me to have to come like this. And you, you, you sense God's breaking heart in Hosea. He hated to do this to his people, but he had no choice. They gave him no choice. Well, now let's look at the prophets in detail. Amos, the year is 750 BC, right in the middle of this 8th century. And one day a man appeared at Bethel and stood on the temple steps and preached. But he was a southerner, a Sassanac. <laughs> you know, it's as if a pommy went to Australia and told Australia how bad it was. I have experienced that, <clears throat> quite literally. And isn't it amazing that God sent a southerner to the north to speak to them? And that was really handicapping him for a start but God couldn't find anyone in the north he could use. And Amos was not a prophet, he was a, a poor farmer. The poorest kind of farming was to look after sycamore trees. The sycamore produces a little fruit which is called the poor man's fig. And this poor little man had a little sycamore grove and he sold these poor man's figs. Of all the people for God to choose, but you know, 1 Corinthians 1 says God loves to confound the somebodies by choosing a nobody. And Amos was a nobody, 12 miles south of Jerusalem in a little place there called Tekoa, right in the heart of the southern part of the people of God. God spoke to this man under his sycamore trees. From the bottom rung of the social ladder, he said, you're the man to go and tell the north what's going to come to them. He'd had no religious training non-ordained, non-professional. God chose him for what he was not. And that's so like God. Do you know why God chose Israel? Because they were not. He says so. He said, I didn't choose you because you were great or powerful or clever. I chose you because I loved you. Full stop. The reason for God's choice lies in him rather than us. I mean, just look round. <laughs> Paul says that in one Corinthians, he says, look at you. Not many wise, not many noble, the world wouldn't have chosen you. God chooses the nobodies and Amos is such a nobody. And uh, do you know why God does that? It's because he then gets the glory. If he chose the clever people and the rich people and the powerful people, they'd get the glory. But he doesn't, he chooses nobodies. Then he gets the glory. So God chose this man, a man of tremendous courage, I mean to go from the south to the north and stand publicly alone on the temple and condemn it. In the name of God, that man's asking for trouble. But he went and of course he was bound to arouse hostility and opposition, which he did. And chapter 7 of the book of Amos gives you a remarkable insight into his personal life and reaction to what he encountered. And I would say two things about Amos from chapter 7 which are remarkable. Number one, his praying affected God. And number two, but his preaching angered men. Get hold of those two things. His praying affected God. There was one occasion when he persuaded God to change his mind. God showed him two pictures, first of locusts coming and eating everything in the countryside and then a fire come and burning everything in the towns. And he saw these two pictures, he saw all the green countryside eaten up by locusts, then he saw the towns burning and nothing left but bare earth and charred rubble. And do you know what he said? He said, Sovereign Lord, he said, I beg you not to do that. He said, how could Jacob survive? He is so small. And he pleaded with God not to do that. God said, all right, I won't. You can affect God like that. Isn't that incredible? Now, do you notice he didn't say Israel, he said Jacob. 
But of course, those two names belong to the same person. But Jacob was the corrupt schemer who became Israel, the limping prince. <laughs> Remember the story? And isn't it interesting that Amos pleads not for Israel but for Jacob? As much as say he's reverted to type. He's gone back to what Jacob was. Israel is no longer Israel, it's Jacob again. The schemer, the man who wants to get rich quick, the man who makes bargains, the man who deceives even his own father to get the blessing. You see? It is a perfect way of saying in one word what had happened up here. Israel had gone back to being Jacob before he met God and wrestled with the angel. But he says, Jacob is so small, please don't do that. And his praying actually made God relent. Moses had the same experience and one remembers Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Your prayer can change God. <coughs> Can't change his character, but can change his plans. I find that incredible truth, isn't it? This is no impersonal God who's decreeing things up there that happen like fate. No, no. This is a God who listens to us. God who wants us to persuade him. That's why Jesus said, go on knocking when you pray. Go on knocking until he gets out of bed and gives you bread. See? You can affect God by your prayer. Amazing truth. But the other side of it is that his preaching angered men and it particularly angered the religious leaders. I'm afraid uh, prophets are not popular with priests or pastors. There will always be enmity because prophets are against the status quo. They are a threat and people don't like threats. How did Amos get his messages? Well, he had visions while he was awake and dreams while he was asleep, pictures in his mind and so often it says the words which Amos saw and again, keeps coming, I see. Do you know one of the words for an Old Testament prophet? He was called a seer, a seer, because he saw things that other people didn't see. He could see what was going on, he could see into the future. I like that phrase, a seer. God needs people who can see what's happening. And there are an awful lot of pictures in Amos. He saw things and he painted verbal pictures. One of the most uh, telling and which forms a climax to his prophecy is a basket of ripe fruit. But it is so ripe that he realises it's, it's on the verge of going totally bad. You know, it is so ripe. When you get a really ripe apple or pear, you hardly dare touch it because it turns brown as, as soon as you put a thumb on it. That's what he saw. He saw Israel as ripe for rottenness. Vivid picture, this basket of ripe fruit. How did he see God? Well, he saw God invariably as a lion. And of course in those days there were lots of lions, they're not now, they've all been obliterated. They lived in the jungle along the Jordan River and they came up from the Jordan jungle into the hills every night looking for lambs and things. And uh, Amos says of God, the lion has roared, who will not tremble? It's a vivid picture of God. And then he describes what's going to happen. He said it's like a shepherd and the lion gets one of his lambs and the shepherd only rescues an ear and a couple of legs from the lion's mouth. That's all that's going to be left of Israel, an ear and a couple of legs. Vivid picture language, but that's how to capture people's interest and imagination. Pictures, let them see it. Interesting, when we understand something, we always say, oh, I see. Why don't we say, I think? <laughs> see? But we say, I see. And if you can see something, that's great help. So his book is really a collection of sermons. It has no structure. It's very difficult to analyse the book as a whole because it's a collection of separate sermons or separate prophecies or messages and they vary in length, but they are memorable. It's as if he's planting time bombs in their hearts which will go off later. And indeed that's what happens invariably when you preach and teach the Word of God. You're planting time bombs and the Holy Spirit brings them back to memory later and they explode inside and they affect you quite deeply. 
first of all, he, he believed in poetry. Most prophecy is poetic. If you have a Bible, poetry is indicated with shorter lines instead of like columns of newspaper print. Hope you've got a Bible that distinguishes. You see, prose is the language of the head, but poetry is the language of the heart. When you see prose in the Bible, then think God's thoughts after him, but when you see poetry, feel God's feelings. The Bible is full of God's emotions. God is not without passion. He is full of feelings. God has feelings too and we need to understand that. Understand what makes him angry, what makes him sad, what makes him feel sick, what makes him happy. Do you ever ask God, how do you feel about me today? People become obsessed with their feelings about God, but actually our future depends on his feelings about us. And the poetic language in Amos is in a particular poetic form which is called a dirge, heavy poetry. Now, some poetry is very light and lifts you, but some is very heavy and it's more of a dirge. I think of Dylan Thomas's poetry, that uh, drunken Welsh poet. Think of his poem, Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying light. Oh, that's a poem written just before he died, but it's heavy poetry that, isn't it? There's a dirge in it. It's sort of somber, it, sonorous. That's the kind of poetry that Amos spoke in, in the original Hebrew, of course. He's also keen on another, or the Spirit inspired him to use another uh, literary device, repetition. <coughs> repetition, which is very effective when you're speaking. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man, and Brutus is an honourable man, and Brutus is an honourable man. Do you remember that speech? It's so effective. Or Martin Luther King, I have a dream. I have a dream. I have a dream. People remember speeches like this, and Amos is full of them. I've already quoted one, yet you did not return to me, yet you did not return to me. Seven times, yet you did not return to me. But let's look at, at a typical prophecy of Amos and uh, see how skillfully his refrain here is for three sins, even for four. That's the refrain, it keeps coming. But look how he circles in on Israel. He begins way out with Israel's neighbours and then he comes a little nearer with Israel's cousins. Then he comes a little nearer with Israel's sister, Judah, in the south. And all his congregation saying, Amen, hallelujah, they're dreadful people, you know. Those people in Damascus, they deserve God's punishment. Yet it's so easy to see how bad other people are. When anybody says, why doesn't God deal with all the bad people in the world, they always seem to assume that God would not have to deal with them. Have you noticed? Amazing. We can always see the faults in others. And Amos, what a skillful prophecy this is. He starts with Damascus. He says, for three sins, even for four, God will deal with Damascus. Now, Damascus is not part of the people of God, so it was dealt with for inhumanity, in particular for cruelty. Then Gaza which was noted for its brutality. Then Tyre for treachery. And people said, great preacher this Amos. He's really letting them have it, you know? And uh, it's rather like the person who thanked a vicar for his sermon and said, you know, everything you said applied to someone I know. <laughs> you know, you sit in church, hope she's listening to that bit. That's how he got them, you see. Then he moves in to their cousins. Edom, Ammon and Moab, and he says God will deal with Edom for three sins, even four, ruthlessness, Ammon, their barbarity, Moab, sacrilege, for treating sacred things profanely. And they're still there nodding, saying, preach it, brother, preach it, brother. <laughs> and he moves a little closer, he says, your sister Judah, God will deal with Judah for rejecting the laws of God and accepting the lies of men. Say, so, yes, he should do. That's why we split from them. Judah's no good. And then comes the shock. He's got all the audience with him. And then he says, for three sins and four, 
I will deal with you. See how skillfully he opens his ministry? Brilliant preaching. And he talks about the insensitivity of Israel's children, the inhumanity of her neighbors, the infamy of her cousins, the infidelity of her sister, but finally the insensitivity. You've forgotten even how to blush. You're totally insensitive to what's going on. You are exploiting the poor among men and you're indulging your flesh before God. And you don't even seem to realize it. You've accepted it all. And the main message he has for Israel is that past redemption means future retribution. He says, you only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I must punish you more severely. You've had more privileges than any other nation, therefore you have more responsibility. Now that's a principle that runs through even to the New Testament. We are among those who have heard the Gospel, who do know the Ten Commandments, and therefore God will deal with us more severely, judge us by a higher standard, because we have known, whereas others have not known. Powerful preaching. There's another sermon here that's full of the word woe, and it's a series of curses. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There's another sermon he preaches built around the word seek. Seek me and live. Seek the Lord. Seek good and not evil. And it's a whole sermon built around the word seek. Seek. And seek involves making an effort to find something out. But my time has gone, so let me just summarize with his final message. Tis the basket of ripe fruit that are to the point of being rotten, and the key word in his final prophecy is never. I will never forget anything you have done. God records everything. He only forgets what he's forgiven, but the rest he never forgets. And he says they will fall, the ten tribes of Israel will fall, never to rise again. And then suddenly in the midst of this terrible, permanent sentence, it's as if the sun breaks through the clouds. And he says, but not all of you. Only the sinners in Israel will disappear. There will be a remnant. And he said, I will build again the tabernacle of David and I'll bring Gentiles in to take your place in the people of God under a king of David's line. And the whole thing becomes a, a final bit of good news, yet I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob. And this idea of a remnant of faithful people, in other words, even in all that, there was a little remnant, a little minority, who kept true to God, and they will survive and be part of an enlarged people of God that will include Gentiles. And that prophecy of Amos is quoted in Acts 15 by James. I will restore the tabernacle of David and bring the Gentiles in. And so we've replaced the faithless Jews. Not all of them. There was always a remnant of faithful Jews, as Paul says in Romans 11. But we've been brought in under the house of David. And the last never in Amos is, I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them. So the last key word is never. Never. God is the God of the never. Amen.